Today in the workshop, it's episode 8 of the Build a Real Robot series. Today we'll look at the design parameters for the motor controllers. We'll see how they integrate into DB1, and we'll look at some of the commands we'll use to control the motors over the I2C bus. We're getting things under control today, so welcome to the workshop. Hello and welcome to the workshop and to the eighth part on our series of building a real robot. Now before we get going with today's video, I need to let you know about something that's happened over here in the workshop. This has actually been quite a week and considering I'm filming this at 5 a.m. on Tuesday morning, that's a strong statement to make since the week has really only started. But non-workshop related issues aside, there was a workshop related issue that happened this week that is affecting a bit of the development of DB1 and may indeed affect the video that I'm trying to put together for this Saturday's DroneBot workshop. And what has happened is I was working yesterday on the workbench with the computer that I have behind the workbench and decided that, hey, it's been a while since I've rebooted this computer. Maybe I'll just do that. I like to do that every now and then and then just run updates and stuff on it. Well, I restarted the computer and got that horrible message that no boot device was available. Please insert a boot device and press any key to continue. In other words, the SSD, the solid state drive in the computer, had failed, which was a bit of an annoyance considering I only installed that SSD four months ago. But it is what it is. The computer would not boot up. Now, the SSD is under warranty, plus I'm going to order another one today and put it in. And I haven't actually lost any data because I don't keep my data on my computer. I keep it on network storage devices, which in turn are black backed up to cloud servers. So I'm in no danger of losing data. But what did happen is that I had to bring a Windows computer into the workshop to continue the work. Now that's fine, it's got all the software on it that I need, except I went to hook it up to the Arduino Pro Min excuse me, Arduino Nano clone that I'm using and it wouldn't recognize it. Now this is not uncommon in Windows machines and it has to do with a driver you need to install for the USB chip. It uses something called a CH340G and sometimes you need a driver for Windows whereas Linux just recognizes it right off the bat. So I tried installing the driver. Well, I tried several sources for the driver. I could not install it. It kept finishing with a error, driver not installed message, and no more details than that. So this is a long-winded explanation of why you are going to see this on DB1 right now. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is an Arduino Uno clone. I'm using this instead of the Arduino Nano. Now, naturally, I'm not going to be building my final device using a couple of Arduino Unos, because remember, there is a controller for each one of the motors. Instead, I'm going to develop on the Uno, and I may actually develop the final product using the ATmega328P chip instead of using something like a Nano or a Pro Mini or something. I'll make that decision a little bit later. A lot depends on the status of the computers. Now, some of you may ask, well, don't you have a Linux computer over here you could use? Yes, I do, and it will work fine with my Nano clone. However, I do want to show you folks some code samples, not today, but in the next lesson. And in order to do those screen recordings, I use an external HDMI HDMI recorder box. I don't use screen recorder software. Plus the aspect ratio on this is all wrong. This does not have an HDMI output. Another thing is, considering all the things that are happening this week in the workshop, this machine is a backup for the two machines that are similar to it that I use to record the audio for all of my videos. I use two separate machines, each running Audacity, and they're both little netbooks like this. This one can act as a backup device if one of those fails. And like I said, with all that's been going on this week, I just don't want to take my chances. So at any rate, sorry for the long-winded intro, but what we're going to do today is look at the design of the motor control. 
controller. So I'm going to show you how I'm designing this. And then next week when we get together, I'm hopefully going to be showing you the motor controller in action, or at least be able to show you some of the code that's come out of my design. So let's go right now and see how the motor controller design is going to work. Now here are some of the design parameters for the DB1 motor controllers. Note that I am saying controllers because there is an independent controller for each motor, even though they are all mounted on the same circuit board. The controllers are based upon the ATmega328P microcontroller. Now this is the microcontroller used in the Arduino Uno, as well as the Arduino Nano and the Arduino Pro Mini. In my design, I may use an Arduino Nano or Pro Mini, but right now I'm leaning towards just using an ATmega328P chip on its own. The controllers provide both PWM and direction signals for the Cytron motor drivers. They receive input from the rotary encoder on the gear motors. The controllers interface to the Arduino Mega 2560 using I2C. There is also an emergency stop input. Now this is a signal that is common to both controllers. When a signal is received on this input, all the motors will come to a complete stop and the controllers will not respond to any more commands until it is specifically cleared. Now here's a diagram of the hookup of the controllers. Please note that although I am only showing one motor and one Cytron driver, in actual fact there will be two of those. Now you can see the Arduino Mega connects to the controller via I2C. There's also a connection from the Mega to the emergency stop input. It comes from one of the digital output pins on the Arduino Mega. In actual fact, there will be more than one emergency stop input so that other sources can stop the motors as well. The driver output on the motor controller will connect to the input on the Cytron motor drivers. And the rotary encode input is connected to the rotary encoder output on the back of the gear motor. Now the controllers will be controlled via I2C and here is a chart of some of the commands that I'll be using. Please note that at this point this is a tentative chart and it may change over time. Now as you can see I have a number of commands and many of them have additional parameters. The parameters that are shown in brackets are optional parameters and they are not always applicable. Let's look at the first command, move PWM. The first parameter is the speed of the PWM. This is a value of 1 to 255 that indicates the PWM signal. The second parameter is the direction, and those two parameters are required. The third parameter is the time, the amount of time we want to move the motor for. Now this is an optional parameter, and if it is not given, the motor will discontinue to move until another command is received. The fourth and fifth parameters are accelerate and decelerate. In other words, do you want the motor to slowly accelerate and decelerate or come to an immediate start and an immediate stop? Now note that this is not always applicable. For example, if I don't give a time parameter, then the accelerate parameter is still valid, but the decelerate parameter would not be in that case. Now move RPM does essentially the same thing, except it takes the speed in RPM rather than in a PWM number. Move distance moves a distance in centimeters, and you need to specify the distance and the direction. You can also specify the speed you want to move at, and again accelerate and decelerate parameters. The stop parameter will naturally stop the motor, and it has an optional decelerate parameter. The following commands don't have any parameters. Read RPM will just bring back the current RPM of the motor. Clear stop is the command that is sent after an emergency stop has been executed. And get status will give you the current status of the motor controller. Again, these are all tentative parameters and this may change during the motor controller design. 
All right, now that we've looked at the design specifications for the motor controller, I want to talk a little bit about how I'm doing the development. Now, as I said, I'm using this Arduino Uno right now, and it actually, there is a silver lining in this cloud, so to speak. A Uno uses one of these connectors, and I've got this nice long printer cable I no longer use anymore because all of my printers are network attached and it allows me to have the development computer which is now the Windows box on this workbench in front of me and keep the uh, robot on this bench at the back. I've got it sort of up on blocks so to speak so that the wheels can't go anywhere while I'm testing it and this nice long cable lets me extend it and of course I've got the nice long umbilical cord that I built in order to power it and I'm powering that off of the 5 volt and 12 volt power supply on my workbench at the moment so I haven't even bothered to drag in the uh, little ATX power supply that I built to power the robot. That power supply will come in a lot handier when the robot starts to move and I have to take it out of this room and into other areas of the basement. But at any rate the way I'm developing this is I'm doing it kind of piecemeal. I tend to do that with pieces of code that are going to end up being very complex. This one isn't going to be exceptionally complex, but it will have a lot of elements to it. What I've done to start with is I've written some code just to simply exercise everything, to exercise the motor in both directions at different speeds, so I know that at least everything is working over there. I already know that because I tested it last week with the Mega. Then I've written some code in order to read the rotary encoders and make sure I can get the readings and the RPM from that. And then I'm going to go on and continue to write functions using those two building blocks and get everything working without the I2C. Once I've got that all working, then I'll add the I2C and move on over here to the Arduino Mega and start writing the code that is needed to control the motor. So I'm going to be working on that this week and next week we'll get back together. We'll see how far I've come along. I may even have some hardware together by that time I'm hoping to because I was originally planning to do the motor controller as a two-part section of this series it may become a three-part section I'm not sure but that's just the nature of this project now before we go today I wanted to mention first of all I've got a lot of great response to the videos I'd like to thank you all for that I've got a lot of particular comments about the issue I was having with traction and the wheels uh, there's one fellow who says he's using the same wheels that I'm using and he saw Solve the problem just with a bit of sandpaper on the wheels and the surface on the wheel is pretty smooth so that might do the trick as well. Another person commented and it's a very valid comment on the fact that the wheels on DB1 are so close together. Now I'm aware of that. I was aware of it at the beginning of the project that I could end up having some problems putting the wheels close together. There are two different aspects to look at over here. With the wheels close together, yes indeed, the problem I'm having with differences between the front and the back is greatly magnified because the wheels are so close and this traction problem could indeed be caused by that. But another thing about separating the wheels farther apart is when the robot is executing a 180 degree turn, when it's going around like that, if the drive wheels are very far from the back wheels, it's going to need more space to execute that turn in. And so with the wheels closer together, the robot can make that turn very close to the same way a human being could turn himself around. Now the ideal arrangement might have been that wheel arrangement that I showed you at the beginning of this series with the four Omni wheels with a, basically a box with one wheel on each side where only two wheels are driven at the same time. That is the perfect one for doing the turn or for doing a 90 degree angle, but of course you have the inefficiency of having... <music>